rivers and wetlands are the lifeblood of the catchment. We're so attracted to water, we're so dependent on water, they hold a very special and important place in the scheme of things and therefore understanding how the landscape is working, how the rivers are actually work, and you might think it's obvious but we've found that they're very complex ecosystems. Over to my left here we have the Oyster Harbour itself near the coast at Albany, then two main rivers heading out the Calgon and the King and they spread right up to the Parongarups and then the Stirling Range is nearly 100 kilometres away and across to north of Mount Barker. So it's quite a big area to manage, but to really to protect the resources, you need to manage the catchment. We've got some ancient fish traps here that are around about close on 7,000 years old. The whole thing about this has all been based on sustainability from when people were using these fish traps, never keeping small fish, fish with eggs in them are always released. It's an old corroboree ground, it's a meeting place where people from all different regions would come together to sit, sharing and you know, exchanging stories and leaving gifts and things as well. It's all because of this harbour which was formed 8,000 years ago. To see what's going on here now, from 30 years ago we were looking at quite a polluted harbour. Our seagrasses had disappeared, our oysters and mussels had pretty much been outfished. That had a really a terrible effect. Oyster Harbour Catchment Group was the first total catchment group to be formed in Western Australia on the basis that the two rivers feeding into Oyster Harbour were contributing huge amounts of phosphorus and other nutrients which was destroying the condition of the quality of Oyster Harbour. The catchment group really formed to try and protect the resources in the catchment and to foster sustainable production to ensure those resources are protected into the future. It was formed from several smaller conservation groups within the same area. We were given considerable assistance from government departments to secure its success. Oyster Harbour Catchment Group's aim is really to represent landholders in trying to access funding for projects which can help to foster sustainable production. We are out there sort of batting for our local area. As a whole, we really want to encourage that sustainable production and also promote what landholders are actually doing already and help sort of meet the needs of where they need information into the future. The goal changes and you may start off on one project and then you suddenly find there's something totally different that he's attending to. So you're running one down and you've got to run another one up. And quite often what you do today is affecting what happens tomorrow and you've got to deal with the side effects of that. In the early days there was so much to be done from the agricultural point of view. A way of runoff from farms, salinity build up, degradation of reserve land and river riparian vegetation. In those days we had to rely on fairly what would be considered now very basic technology, hard copy aerial photos, digital devices were just on the increase. I do remember uh, GPS units were not very accurate mm. and so a lot of these things made it difficult to really get to know where catchments were, where waterways were and let alone how you actually manage those. The biggest change has been just raising awareness of the landholders and that means that they are really happy to just do whatever work we need to do to protect the waterways. So lots of fencing, lots of revegetation, lots of thinking about the way they're using fertilisers and the way that water is running across the surface of their properties so that it's not impacting too much on with nutrient and sediment running into the streams. All of those things over the 35 years that's just gained momentum to the point now where it's just standard practice for most of them in the cat and they are remarkable what they're prepared to do. They can see the benefits of their efforts because works that they've done you know, 20 plus years ago, they can actually see how that's led to improvements on their properties, but also in the general health of the river and of course the harbour. If you look at the catchment itself, one of the major land uses is actually pasture for grazing. That's important because that's our biggest opportunity to manage nutrients going into the harbour. So that's where we can have the biggest impact on reducing nutrients. The soil testing program is about trying to get landholders to 
assess their soils and to apply the right amounts of fertiliser to maintain their production but not to apply an excess because that's where we have a danger for the harbour. If there's a high amount of nutrients and you're putting more on, that phosphorus going into the harbour can trigger eutrophication through toxic algal blooms. Bruce just rocks up with 20 bags and a drill bit and yeah, I just jump on the motorbike, you just go around each paddock, do your course line, you do your 30 and you've, you've got an app that you plug in your GPS points. You can sort of match where your production is or where you want to target. It's very important for us to keep soil testing and, and tissue testing because it does allow us to improve our soil health and use the, use the nutrients that we have in the, in the soil by not over applying more than what we need. Basically probably for the last seven years our main phosphorus source has been compost. The nutrient testing has helped us to know that what we're doing is still maintaining our nutrient level in our soil and giving us confidence to go further forward and keep doing what we're doing. We haven't applied any super phosphate here for over seven years and our, our phosphorus levels and even our potassium levels are all still maintaining or have even improved over that time. In agriculture, like in many industries, we've seen a massive change in the way the system works over the last 20 or 30 years. The biggest shift that we've made probably is to go to no-till cropping. My opinion, that is the biggest single difference um, that's made the most difference in the last 20 or 30 years because that has meant full stubble cover on the ground all the time and really reduced the threats of wind and water erosion. We're now on the upper echelons of the King River. King River drops down very rapidly in size but there's a big floodplain here. Originally when it was first cleared there was no paper marks on this flat and I've planted all these paper barks about year 2000 along the creek. That's to hold the soil so the soil doesn't wash down the creek. And out in the flats out here, I've got all perennials growing and that's to stop the movement of soil and nutrients through the soil. I think the paper barks along the creek have done a magic job. The positive effects in the Oyster Harbour itself particularly are huge. There's new industries developing in Oyster Harbour which rely on the quality of the water. Over my time Oyster Harbour has changed dramatically with the amount of silt built up and the reeds and the trees and the birds all come back to fish. It just changes the environment totally in what we do up here, up in the top end of the catchment. Since we took over, we've actually fenced all the riversides and done a lot of re-veg projects to actually try and, you know, re-establish more of a natural environment in places that were quite degraded, you know, 20 years ago, that we could see were, were causing big problems with the ecosystem of the river that we thought were quite important to protect. The mix of seeds was designed by Oyster Harbour Catchment Group. They have, have input into the right species for the right site according to the soil type and area. All the water that runs off our farm runs into the river and then from there on into the catchment and down into Oyster Harbour. We have quite a big river frontage on our property because we're sort of a long skinny property so a lot of our stuff was going to the river so we were very aware as Martin said that anything we do on the property affects the river system here and further down. That links in to what other people, other farms are doing further down the catchment and, and further up the catchment and we're all sort of part of the, the catchment together. You know everyone has to do their bit really you know whether it comes to the reveg and the fencing also the feral animal control the foxes and cats protecting our wildlife. If we had done all that work and nobody else had bothered to consider of anything, you wouldn't see the improvements you know, in, in terms of water quality and um, soil runoff and other things down in Albany. But doing it together as a catchment approach, um, yeah, I think really multiplies those benefits. Around 1994, I had a little bit of an idea, a different take on attempting to transplant seagrasses, which hadn't been successful at that stage and my initial trial actually was highly successful. So I set up more extensive trials in 1997, and from that I determined a 97% survival rate with these transplants and an extremely good growth rate. From that, I started looking at restoration work. A lot of it was based on large, finding large bare areas and planting randomly within that. So this is the mouth of the Calgon River. Uh, the macroalgae uh, beds originated in this area here and they then sequentially moved down over the next three, four years 
right down into the southeast corner where they washed ashore and then were lost. Um, all that survived were these tiny little patches of seagrass which were less than one and a half metres diameter. All of the darker material here is actually macroalgae. This area from Swan Point right down an area of about 130 hectares is now um, by 2018 it was 100% seagrass. We've gone from two to three hectares in 1988-89. That is now 100% cover from the shallows down to a mean water depth of 2.8 metres. The recovery has been absolutely fantastic. It's not just due to restoration efforts, it's also due to vast improvements in the catchment. The management and the land care groups have done a fantastic job. The seagrass would not have grown if the water quality had not been restored to a significant degree. What I have achieved here in Oyster Harbour was only possible because the farmers were doing their bit, the land care groups were doing their bit. So, you know, if the water quality had not been improved, then the seagrasses wouldn't have recovered to the extent that they have now. It's easy to think that what we do here, how can it be making much of a difference? When I started back 30 years ago, you know, you fence a bit here and you plant a few trees there and you think, well, how on earth is this going to make a difference in the longer term? But the thing is, over time, it all adds up. And when everybody's doing it, suddenly you can't go anywhere without seeing amazing work that's been done over a long period of time that is making a fantastic difference. And now, we can very proudly all of us say that, well, look at Oyster Harbour, look what we've achieved there, because, you know, one of the few places in the world where the water quality in the harbour has been able to be reclaimed virtually back to the point where you can make the, eco you know, get the ecosystem of the harbour back again. So, you know, I think we should all be very proud of that. We don't actually promote nearly well enough that as farmers and landholders and communities, we've done that, you know, over a long time and a lot of it's been hard-working volunteers that have driven it and I think it's a fantastic achievement. I would like to see in the future a greater culture within South Coast communities, not just an interest in the environment but being prepared to commit to contribute in some way. We are desperately, have been saying desperately for two or three years, we have to get more of the young ones are the ones who may not have even been alive when Oyster Harbour started and we'd like them to be involved because there's going to be new challenges that they will have to cope with and there's no point us oldies thinking we can handle it because we can't. Those looking back I feel uh, very proud to be a part of that initial formation of the Oyster Harbour Catchment Group and our years of involvement in it. Who would have thought back then with the few people in a room, who would have thought it would still be going, still working just as hard as ever because there's still always so much to do. But the great thing is now that with the work that we do, we know that it makes a difference because we just have to come down here and we can see it. We know that whatever we do, it's going to make a difference and that just gives you that extra incentive I suppose just to keep keep going with it all knowing that um, everything we do has been effective will continue to be effective and you know future generations will reap the benefits of what we've been able to do. We've got to this point now where it, it's almost in pristine conditions and we're seeing fish species coming back that we hadn't seen here for probably a hundred years. The mussel farm is back in business now and we know that you know the mussels and the oysters they they filter and clean our water. So they're doing a magnificent job as well. Obviously now it's all about maintaining and sustaining what we've got here. So there's still a lot more work to go and having groups like Oyster Harbour, Catchment Group, education programs here all the time for our future generations to continue maintaining this place when we are no longer able to. Every place where we've been, every fence we've put up, every tree that's come up, every animal sighting that we've had, all of those are equally as important to us. And um, as time has gone by, there's not a place in the catchment where you can't go and see some of the work that we've done. All of those little activities of all over time just joined up and turned into something amazing and magnificent. For us, the harbour is the thing, it's the end game, but all of the remarkable work and the incredible biodiversity right from the bottom of the catchment to the top is just as important and treasured by all of us. Mm -hmm.